This afternoon, we are going to look at anatomy of the heart. I believe that uh, last week you did a practical on the mediastinum. And in particular, you looked at the anterior mediastinum, superior mediastinum, posterior mediastinum, even mid mediastinum, you must have mentioned things there. And one of the things you mentioned was the heart, but you didn't do the study of the heart in detail. So I want us to have that lecture on anatomy of the heart so that we'll then look at uh, practical on the heart this particular week. This is what you're going to learn in this lecture. We are going to describe the anatomical position of the heart. We are also going to describe the blood supply to the heart where we look at the arterial supply as well as the venous drainage. We'll talk about the layers of the coverings of the heart. The covering of the heart is called the pericardium. So we'll talk about the layers of the pericardium. We'll then talk about the chambers and valves of the heart. We'll talk about histological layers of the heart wall. We'll talk about the histological features of cardiac muscle cells. This one we did last trimester, but we will revisit it for the sake of completion. And lastly, we'll talk about the components of the conduction tissue of the heart. So it's a quick, brief lecture. Uh, let's start with the anatomical position of the heart. So if someone asks you where the heart is located, don't just say that the heart is located on the left side, because that may not be entirely true if taken superficially like that. The truth of the matter is that the heart is located within the middle mediastinum. And it's actually at the center of the middle mediastinum. In terms of that position, the heart is actually a midline organ. So just saying vaguely that the heart is located to the left does not qualify a number of concepts the heart is located in the middle of the body. However, this is the deal breaker, that although it's a midline organ, one third of it lies to the right of the midline, and uh, two thirds of it lie to the left of the midline. In simple terms, there's a larger part of it that falls to the left, than to the right. So basically, that is the actual position of the heart. Middle mediastinum with two thirds of it being to the left of the spine and uh, one third of it to the right of the spine or to the right of the midline. In terms of its position, the apex of the heart usually points anteriorly, inferiorly, and to the left side. And this apex of the heart is contributed by the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is what forms the apex of the heart. That apex is anterior, inferior, and to the left side, formed by the left ventricle. From the surface, the apex of the heart correspond with the fifth intercostal space of the left midclavicular line. Fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. So the fifth intercostal space overlie the apex of the heart along the midclavicular line of the left. And that's where we'll then feel the apex beat. When you want to confirm that someone's heartbeat is still beating, we usually go for the apex beat and that is where you feel the apex beat. If the heart has an 
apex, then it means it also has a base. The base of the heart is not inferior as you may want to think, but it is posterior. So the chamber of the heart that forms the base is the left atrium. The left atrium is what forms the base of the heart and it is behind, it is posterior. Other than the apex and the base, the heart also has borders. There's the right heart border and the left heart border. Let's start with the left heart border. The left heart border is formed predominantly by the left ventricle, as we can see here, predominant by the left ventricle and uh, slightly by the left auricle, as we can see here. And in this practical season, we are going to understand the difference between an atrium and an auricle. So when you look at the heart practically, you will see the difference between atrium and auricle. So that you don't just use them interchangeably. The left heart border is formed by the left auricle logo and uh, the left ventricle predominantly. The right heart border, on the other hand, is formed predominantly by the right atrium together with the superior vena cava. So we have the superior vena cava and the right atrium forming the right heart border. Those concepts, you need to remember them even radiologically when you'll be evaluating the chambers of the heart from a chest radiograph, you need to remember that those are the parts that form the borders of the heart. The inferior border of the heart is this one. The inferior border of the heart is, predom is formed predominantly by the right ventricle. The right ventricle is the one that is forming the inferior border predominantly, but again, partially by the left ventricle and right atrium. Those ones form the inferior border slightly, but predominantly by the right ventricle. Then we have the anterior surface of the heart. The anterior surface of the heart is a part of the heart that faces the sternum. That part is predominantly formed by the right ventricle and partially by the left ventricle. So right ventricle predominantly, partially by the right vent, by the left ventricle. Then finally, we have the inferior surface of the heart. The inferior surface of the heart not shown in these images refer to the part of the heart that rests on the diaphragm. And for that reason, you call it the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. The diaphragmatic surface of the heart is formed by both ventricles equally. So we have the right and the left ventricle equally forming the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. All right, so that is the location and position of the heart. Now let's talk about the blood supply to the heart, where we'll discuss the arterial supply as well as the venous drainage. So the heart, just like any other organ, also needs oxygen supply. And the arteries which supply the heart are called the coronary arteries. Conventionally, we have two coronary arteries, the right and the left coronary artery. These coronary arteries arise from the ascending outer. So the right and the left coronary artery both arise from the ascending aorta. Let's say something about these coronary arteries. The right coronary artery supplies a smaller volume of the heart compared to the left coronary artery. 
which means that the left coronary artery supplies a bigger volume of the heart. However, even though the right coronary artery supplies a smaller volume of the heart, the right coronary artery gives branches to the most of the parts of the conduction tissue of the heart. The examples of the branches that the right coronary artery give include the sinoatrial node artery, you can call it SA nodal artery. We also have the atrioventricular node artery, you can call it AV nodal artery. And we have this artery here, which we call the posterior interventricular artery, which in most cases come from the right coronary artery. And those three arteries I've mentioned, among others, supply the conduction tissue of the heart, the regions where impulses travel. So even though the right coronary artery is not so big in terms of supplying a massive part of the heart, it supplies vital parts of the heart. The left coronary artery, on the other hand, supplies a bigger volume of the heart. Two key branches of the left coronary artery are the left circumflex. The one I'm pointing is what you call the left circumflex artery. And the one going straight here is called the anterior interventricular artery, also known as the left anterior descending artery, LAD, left anterior descending artery. So the left anterior descending runs between the right and the left ventricle anteriorly, while the posterior interventricular runs between the right and left ventricle posteriorly. The left circumflex runs between the left atrium and the left ventricle. That's the left circumflex. Now, um, there's a concept that we call coronary dominance. There are two levels of coronary dominance. There's what you call anatomical dominance, and there's what you call physiological coronary dominance. The anatomical coronary dominance refers to the coronary artery that gives rise to the posterior interventricular artery, the origin of this artery here. So that is to mean that the posterior interventricular artery is a variant artery. It may come from the right circulation or it may come from the left circulation. So if they allow me to call it PIV, posterior interventricular for PIV, if the PIV arises from the right circulation, then we call that right coronary dominance. If the PIV comes from the left circulation, then we call it left coronary dominance. The right coronary dominance is what majority of people have. About 60 to 80% of individuals have a right coronary dominance. A lesser percentage have a less coronary dominance. In some fewer even scenarios, the PIV may arise from both the right and the left circulation. And when that happens, we call it coronary codominance. So understand coronary dominance is not necessarily the artery that supplies a bigger part of the heart, but basically the origin of the PIV. That is what we are calling the anatomical coronary dominance. Then there's what we call the physiological coronary dominance. The physiological coronary dominance refers to the coronary artery that supplies most of the conduction tissue of the heart. Again, as I told you earlier, the right coronary artery is the one that supplies most of the conduction tissue of the heart. And so in most of the time, we'll have a right coronary dominance physiologically. The advantage here is this, that basically, you see this PIV, the reason why we want to know which artery gives it is because the PIV supplies perhaps the largest part of the conduction tissue of the heart. 
things to do with the, the bundle of his and its branches. They're supplied by the PIV. And so an artery that is anatomically dominant is most likely physiologically dominant. And that's why we then don't so much insist of defining it as anatomical or physiological dominance. And we just talk about coronary dominance because an artery that is anatomically dominant is most likely physiologically dominant in the understanding that PIV supplies the largest part of the conduction tissue of the heart. Right. Um, you may want to check on something called the third coronary artery. I don't know why people call it the third coronary artery of Beda, uh, but you can just check on it, the third coronary artery. I wrote on it some time back, it's in the internet. You'll just read and check on it. But conventionally, we have two coronary arteries, the right and the left coronary artery. If you're going to read on third coronary artery and you want to look at my article, you'll have to add in Kenyans because I study the ones in Kenyans. All right, now let's talk about the veins of the heart. There are several veins of the heart. I don't want to belabor you in knowing their names, all of them. But generally, they're called cardiac veins. Most of these veins join the large ones and drain via a large common channel which we call the coronary sinus. At least I want you to remember coronary sinus is the largest vein of the heart. This coronary sinus carries deoxygenated blood back into the right atrium. And so we have right, the right atrium receiving the coronary sinus as well as the two vena cava, they also open into the right atrium. There are some smaller veins which also drain into the right atrium. There are cardiac veins which don't drain into the coronary sinus. They are tiny though. I really don't want to belabor you with them. In terms of where the vessels run, whether the arteries or the veins, they run between the epicardium and the myocardium of the heart. So the blood vessels are sub-epicardial arteries. They, they, they run in the sub-epicardial zone. There are situations where the artery, however, may go deeper into the myocardium before it comes out between the myocardium and the epicardium. Those regions where arteries enter into the myocardium are known as myocardial bridges. In your practical, make sure you see a few examples of a myocardial bridge. It will make more sense. Very fascinating phenomenon when you see. Okay, I'll ask you two questions. I don't know whether there are two or three I've forgotten, but this is one of the questions I want to ask you and I want you to respond in the chat. I'm giving you one minute to respond to this one. All right, we can proceed. I think most of you have gotten it right in mentioning C. A few of you, however, have gotten it wrong. And I really want you to have a conversation with yourself and also with those who got it right to find out why you are actually wrong and they're right. Now let's talk about stadium. The pericardium refers to the membranes that cover the heart. They're just layers, tissue layers that cover the heart. Because of this covering, they protect the heart 
but they also have a fluid within them which lubricate some of the heart. So in as much as the heart moves a lot, there is less friction. The pericardium protect the heart, but also lubricate the heart so that uh, it prevents friction. Now, let me use a different model to describe for us the organization of the pericardium. Let's check what I've drawn. Let's consider it to be the heart with the vessels that come out of the heart, perhaps the outer and the pulmonary trunk. Then this blue thing, let's consider it to be one of the pericardial layers. This thick blue layer, we call it the fibrous pericardium. So the heart is surrounded by a very thick connective tissue membrane, which we call the fibrous pericardium. This fibrous pericardium, as the name suggests, is a connective tissue layer that surrounds the heart. So because it's connective tissue, it's largely for protection. It holds to the blood vessels that arise from the heart. Inside this uh, fibrous pericardium, there's another layer, now the red one. This red one here is called the serous pericardium. And it doesn't just house the, it doesn't just cover the heart itself. It also lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium, as you can see in this image now. So that red line is called the serous pericardium. <clears throat> it covers the outside surface of the heart and the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium. Having said so, we can now say that the serous pericardium has two parts. The layer of serous pericardium that lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium is called the parato layer of the serous pericardium. And the layer of the serous pericardium that covers the outside of the heart is called the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The serous pericardium is simply a simple squamous epithelial layer as opposed to connect a thick connective tissue layer of the fibrous pericardium. The space between the two is what we call the pericardial cavity. And this pericardial cavity is the one that contains thin fluid membrane that lubricates the heart. You don't want a lot of fluid to be within the pericardial cavity because if there's a lot of fluid in the pericardial cavity, what we call pericardial effusion, it will restrict the heart from expanding. It will limit the diastolic phase of the heart in a situation we call cardiac tamponade, which is actually a cardiac emergency. So we only have thin fluid membrane within the pericardial space that lubricate the heart not a lot of fluid, just thin fluid. Right, so remember that pericardium has two parts, the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium. Fibrous pericardium is connective tissue, serous pericardium is epithelium. The serous pericardium has two layers, the parato layer and the visceral layer. Now, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is also known as the epicardium. That's the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. It is also called the epicardium. Great, now we can talk about the chambers and valves of the heart. I believe everyone in this class knows that the heart has four chambers. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't know that. And I also want to believe that everyone in this class knows how blood flows through the heart chambers. That yes, we have the vena cava, 
So superior vena cava carry blood from the upper part of the body. Inferior vena cava carry blood from the lower part of the body. And the junction is basically the thoracic diaphragm. So blood above the thoracic diaphragm enter by the SVC and blood below the thoracic diaphragm enter by the IVC. They both enter into the right atrium. From the right atrium, blood flows to the right ventricle through the bicus sorry, through the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is the right atrioventricular valve. From the right ventricle, blood flows to the this chamber here, which we call the pulmonary trunk. You will want to commonly call it the pulmonary artery, and there's nothing so much wrong with that statement, except that that will be a little ambiguous. Remember, the right ventricle has only one vessel coming out of it, but we have two lungs. So the vessel that go to each lung is the one we are calling pulmonary artery. We have the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. But those two pulmonary arteries come from a common channel. So the common channel is what we call the main pulmonary artery, or you call it the pulmonary trunk. I prefer calling it main pulmonary artery or pulmonary trunk, because I, if I call it pulmonary artery, it will be ambiguous. So what will you call the others? So from the right ventricle, blood goes to the main pulmonary artery via this valve here, which we call the pulmonary valve. Then now from the main pulmonary artery, that's when blood can now go to the right pulmonary artery to the right lung and left pulmonary artery to the left lung. Remember that stream is the deoxygenated stream of blood. So from the pulmonary artery, blood goes to the pulmonary circulation, which means the lungs, then come back through pulmonary veins. We've talked of two pulmonary arteries, but we talk of four pulmonary veins. There are two pulmonary veins from each lung, superior and inferior pulmonary vein from each lung. So these are the left pulmonary veins. These are the right pulmonary veins. They all open into the left atrium. Remember this blood entering the left atrium is now oxygenated. From the left atrium, blood goes to the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve, which is also known as the mitral valve. This is the left atrioventricular valve. From the left ventricle, blood goes to the aorta through the aortic valve. Now the aorta has three segments. There's a segment going up, which you call the ascending aorta. And that's the one that gives rise to the coronary arteries. Then there is what we call the arc of the aorta. The arc of the aorta, if you remember, is the one that gives us the brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, and left subclavian artery. Then the artery turns to go down in what we call the descending aorta which now give us other branches, as you may know. So basically that is how blood flows through the chambers of the heart. Before we talk about the specific chambers, um, I want you to answer this question as well. So I'm giving you Another, okay, this one is simple, but let me give you one minute still, no problem. So you have one minute to respond to question two. Right, I've seen this one, you people haven't done so well. Maybe because you've not done cardiovascular physiology. And so I'll ex excuse you on that. But when you do it, then you'll know the answer. It's a very simple answer. 
Let's talk about the valves of the heart. So the valves of the heart are basically regions where blood flow is controlled. There are two types of valves. There are those that we call the semi, <coughs> sorry, semilunar valves. And there are those that we call the atrioventricular valves. I want us to start with a semilunar valve. So semilunar valves are the valves which are found between the ventricles and the outflow tracts. When I talk of an outflow tract, I refer to the arteries which arise from the ventricles. We know them. So from the right ventricle, we have the main pulmonary artery. There's a valve between the two. From the left ventricle, we have the aorta. There's a valve between the two. How is a semilunar valve organized? So a semilunar valve is organized in such a way that we have a cusp or a leaflet which attaches onto the vascular wall. Each valve has three leaflets which attach directly onto the inner surface of the blood vessel. And that's why it gives us this appearance of Mercedes-Benz sign. The valve between the left ventricle and the outer is called aortic valve. And the valve between the right ventricle and the main pulmonary artery is called the pulmonary valve. So this is the pulmonary valve and this is the aortic valve. Because of the orientation of the two vessels, the pulmonary valve is anterior to the aortic valve. Remember, each valve has three leaflets or cusps. We are going to answer that question shortly, where we will state where the sound of the valve is heard using a stethoscope. <clears throat> so maybe we can use this one to then answer that question. This is the right ventricle, and this is therefore the pulmonary valve. The sound from the pulmonary valve become translated this way to be heard somewhere here, which will correspond to the left side of the sternum on the second intercostal space. So second intercostal space, left side of the sternum. While this is the aortic valve, the sound from the aortic valve is heard somewhere here, which is corresponding to the right side of the sternum, second intercostal space again. Right side of the sternum, second intercostal space. So what do I want you to notice? I want you to notice that although the pulmonary artery come from the right ventricle, the sound of the pulmonary valve is heard on the left side of the sternum. And although the outer come from the left ventricle, the sound of the aortic valve is heard on the right side of the sternum. The two vessels interchange because of how the vessels are oriented. And when you look at it from gross anatomy, I want you to see that interchange of the arteries. That right ventricle gives you the main pulmonary artery, which goes to the left initially, and the left ventricle gives you the outer, which goes to the right initially, as you can see there. And in this image, you can also appreciate that the left ventricle has a thicker wall compared to the right ventricle. Apart from semilunar valves, we also have the atrioventricular valves. The atrioventricular valves are the valves between the atria and their corresponding ventricles. So we have the right, the left, 
atrioventricular valve. We have the right and the left atrioventricular valve. Today, you people don't know how to use your mics, so let me just mute you permanently. All right, so the right atrioventricular valve is this one. It's also called the tricuspid valve. The left atrioventricular valve is this one. It's also called the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. So those are the valves between the atria and the ventricle. The organization of the valves are like this. Each atrioventricular valve has three components. This is what you call a papillary muscle, is what you call coda tendinae, and is what you call the cusps. So this is the papillary muscle. These muscles are usually on the ventricular side of the heart, as opposed to the atrial side of the heart. And these muscles suspend some string-like structures, which we call the coda tendinae. And this coda tendinae then suspend this flap or uh, leaflet, which we call the cusp. So based on the number of cusps, we now give them their specific names. For example, the right atrioventricular valve has three cusps, and so we call the tricuspid valve. The left atrioventricular valve has two cusps, so we call it bicuspid valve. So I want you to understand the naming system. It's based on the number of cusps that the atrioventricular valves have. In your physiology, you learn when they close, when they open which ones make the first heart sound, which one makes the second heart sound. So this image show you where the specific sounds from the valves are heard when they close. For the pulmonary valve, left, second space. For the aortic valve, right, second space. For the mitral valve, that is the one you hear at the apex. So in the talk of the apex bit, we are actually referring to the sound of the mitral valve, which is the fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line, and that is applicable for an adult. If this was a child, then we'll talk of the fourth space and, and not the fifth space, but it's still left midclavicular line. Now let's talk about the histological layers of the heart wall. There's some things I've not talked about because they're better done practically. And so when you'll be looking at the heart chambers practically, you'll see the internal features of the right atrium. You'll see the internal features of the right ventricle, internal features of the right of the right, left ventricle and the left atrium. I prefer that to be done practically. So there's a segment that you'll actually do practically, which I haven't talked about. Now, histological layers of the heart wall, we have three histological layers of the heart wall. The endocardium is the inner lining of the heart and is lined by simple, uh, simple squamous epithelium. Usually deep beneath that simple squamous epithelium could be some loose connective tissue, which we call the subendocardial zone. Then we have the myocardium. The myocardium is the region of the heart that contains the mass of the heart. This is by far the thickest layer of the heart wall. And as I told you, the left ventricle is even thicker than the right ventricle. Then we have the epicardium. The epicardium is the serous layer is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So the visceral layer of the serous pericardium 
form part of the definitive heart wall, unlike the other layers of the pericardium, which don't form part of the wall of the heart. The parietal pericardium and the fibrous pericardium don't form part of the wall of the heart. They only form part of the pericardium. But the visceral pericardium forms part of the wall of the heart. It is the epicardium. And as I told you, the blood vessels run between that epicardium and the myocardium. Now we can talk about the histological features of cardiac muscle cells. And I think this is where the third question comes. So you have your third question there. Another one minute for you. Uh, let me enable the chat for that purpose. Right, go ahead. The chat is enabled. You have one minute for it. All right, seems like people have forgotten many things about last trimester. Maybe it was just a matter of passing exam. It's okay, at least you passed the exam anyway. So we agree that when we describe muscles, there are a number of parameters that we want to check. As with regard to shape of the cells, we describe cardiac muscles as having short muscle fibers. As with regard to the number of nuclei, cardiac muscle cells are predominantly mononucleated, although a few of the cells are binucleated. As with regard to the location of the nucleus, the nuclei of cardiac muscle cells are centrally located. As with regard to the arrangement of actin and myosin, the actin and myosin are regularly arranged and so giving us the appearance of alternating dark and light bands, what we call striations. So cardiac muscle is striated. The dark bands represent the A band, the region containing myosin, and the light bands represent the I band, the region lacking myosin, or you can say the region containing actin only without myosin. In terms of how the cells join, they join end to end, and we can see those joining here. So this is one cell joining this one through this point. This one cell joining with this one through that point. These junctions are the ones we call the intercalated discs. So these are very unique to cardiac muscle cells, the presence of intercalated discs, very unique to cardiac muscle cells. Within an intercalated disc, there are two things. We have the desmosomes. Remember, desmosomes are a bearing junctions. They are junctions that help to hold adjacent cells together. Apart from desmosomes, we also have the gap junctions. And the gap junctions basically allow free movement of ions from one cell to another. And from a physiological point of view, we said because of that, because they have those electrical junctions, cardiac muscle cells are therefore functionally sensitial. They contract as one unit because if a cell experiences a depolarization event, that depolarization event spread into the surrounding cells quickly. Last but not least, we say that cardiac muscle cells display branching, and this is branching basically, that you see a cell extending into another cell and yet to another one again. So those are the features of cardiac muscle cells from a histological point of view. I remember we also mentioned the physiological properties of cardiac muscle. In terms of how cardiac muscle cells contract, we said cardiac muscle is automatic. And this is to mean that they can contract even without external stimulation. 
cardiac muscles can contract even without external stimulation. As with regard to how the central nervous system control the heart, we say that cardiac muscle is involuntary. And this is to mean that it is not controlled by the consciousness. It is not within your voluntary control. Cardiac muscle is controlled by the autonomic division of the nervous system. And lastly, as with regard to how the muscles contract, because of the gap junctions between the cells, the cells contract as one unit and the term we get for that is functionally sensitive. Last but not least, I want to talk about the components of the conduction tissue of the heart. The conduction tissue of the heart refers to the path that is followed by the cardiac electrical impulse. That's the conduction tissue of the heart. This path is not made by nerves as you may want to think, just made up of specialized cardiac muscle cells. There are cardiac muscle cells which are specialized for this particular role. And how special are these cells? These are the special features of the cells of the conduction tissue. When we say cardiac muscle is mononucleated predominantly and some few cells are binucleated, these are the cells that are predominantly binucleated. The other unique thing about them is that these cells have several gap junctions compared to the other cardiac muscle cells. And then these cells have fewer actin and myosin filaments. And that has an implication on their ability to contract. The cells of the conduction tissue are less contractile compared to the other types of cells of the, of, of the heart. Cells of the conduction tissue contract less compared to the rest of the muscles of the heart. So these are the special features of the cells of the conduction tissue. Now let's follow the path that is followed by the impulses. So from your physiology, you will learn that uh, the impulses are generated somewhere within the right atrium. The region within the right atrium that generates the impulses is called the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node, therefore, becomes the pacemaker. It is the one that determines the pace of the heart. From the sinoatrial node, impulses travel in different direction. One of those direction is that the impulses travel to the left atrium almost at the same time as the impulses are spreading in the right atrium. So this connection between the right atrium and the left atrium is known as the interatrial pathway. And it ensures that the depolarization event that has been generated from the sinoatrial node travels also to the left atrium so that the left atrium can also experience the depolarization that will cause it to contract. While the impulses travel to the left atrium, they also travel to the AV node using three pathways. Because these pathways connect the nodes, we call them the internodal pathways. We have anterior, middle and posterior internodal pathway. The aim of the internodal pathways is just to connect the two nodes, basically. Notice that as the depolarization event is spreading to the AV node, it is going through the right atrium. And that means that at the time that the right atrium will experience the depolarization and also respond by contracting. So when the impulses move to the left atrium and also to the AV node, the two atria respond by contraction. And that's what you call atrial systole. Impulses reach the atrioventricular node and they delay a bit there. Very important to note, and that's why I'm taking a pause. 
that the impulse is delayed in the AV node. Why do the impulses delay in the AV node? The main reason why the impulse is delaying the AV node is so that we can delay the depolarization of the ventricles. Why is that important? See, when the impulses come from the sinoatrial node, you have a depolarization event which spread to the left atrium and to the AV node. It means that the two atria are depolarized almost at the same time, therefore contracting almost at the same time, or let's just say the same time. When the atria are in contraction, you really don't want the ventricles to be in contraction. You want the ventricles to be in relaxation so that they can fully fill with blood from the atria which are contracting. So the avinodal delay ensures that the ventricles are still in diastole when the atria are in contraction. The venodal delay makes sure that we have ventricular filling from atrial systole. After that delay impulses, we then move within the interventricular septum and that part of impulse is called the atrioventricular bundle, and that is known as the bundle of his. When you say bundle of his, you know that name his is someone's name, so it is an uppercase H. The bundle of his is basically taking impulses to the two ventricles, and that is why the bundle of his divides into two. We have the right and the left bundle branches representing the pathway that take impulses to each of the ventricles. Now, the right bundle branch spread to the right ventricle and the left bundle branch spread to the left ventricle. Usually, the left bundle branch divides again into the left anterior bundle branch and left posterior bundle branch, but we don't have to go into that detail. After those bundle branches, we finally have what you call the Parkinje fibers. So these Parkinje fibers are the last component of the conduction tissue of the heart because from the Parkinje fibers, impulses now spread to the rest of the ventricular musculature. So you see um, when the atria contract, this is still in relaxation. After the, sorry, the ventricles are still in relaxation because of the evident delay. After the delay is over, the impulses travel and then the ventricles will undergo depolarization and contract. That's a very organized system because it will be contracting to push the blood that was already now in here, the one that filled when the atria were in contraction. So the heart is a very organized pump. And that is why we still want the sinoatrial node to be the pacemaker for both of the chambers so that we can have an organized way in which pumping of blood can happen. The two atria contract, the ventricle fill. After the ventricle are filled, every another delay is over, the ventricles contract, blood is pumped out of the ventricles. Great, I think more of that you'll discuss through physiology when you talk about the phases of the cardiac cycle and you learn that there are not just two phases of the cardiac cycle, there are actually six phases of the cardiac cycle. You talk of atrial systole, you talk of isovolumic ventricular systole, you talk of ventricular ejection, isovolumic ventricular relaxation, we talk of rapid ventricular filling and we talk of what we call diastasis. Those are the phases of the heart. You learn that through your physiology. You'll also learn the implication of the movement of the impulses from the sinoatrial node to the Parkinje fibers, how that is implicated on what we call the electrocardiography ECG. Great. So my agenda is actually over as with regard to anatomy of the heart. So we'll stop there. Uh, much of what I've not said about the anatomy of the heart is more to do with the morphology of the chambers of the heart. 
and the morphology of the outer surface of the heart, which we will do very well in the practical class. And the guide you have is very good in capturing that. So I'll stop there and allow you to ask questions if you do have.